you're in a cage with a tiger, what don't you want the tiger to do? Charge right at you. Do you either go for it 100% or you don't go for it? It's highly symbolic. You're not administering pain, but you are administering humiliation. It's all about being just right, you know, right on the point. You have to see it and then have it happen so quickly that you're not seeing it. You can be physically excellent and still lose because your mind's not there. It's almost a dance. It's like a, a dance with a goal. You see nothing around you, you see nothing but the target, you see nothing but the moment, and the rest of the world doesn't exist. Fencing is essentially an individual sport. And prior to coming into college, I think my whole sort of focus and mentality around fencing had to do with perfecting every single aspect of my individual competitive edge. It's always just you and trying to get the best result that you can. No one was relying on me, it was just, you know, up to me. Once you get into the college fencing scene, it becomes a team event. All of a sudden, uh, other people are relying on you to do well. When I got to Harvard, I kind of didn't know how the whole team dynamic thing was going to work out. We have to function as one team, men and women. So we have to build a great team environment where an individual really thrives. Remember, you're fencing for yourself, but then again, you're also fencing for your team. Every bout, every touch counts. One, two, three, HFT! When you walk into our fencing room, you feel the history and tradition of Harvard fencing. I think the history of Harvard fencing made it pretty special to be a part of that team, and I don't think that was lost on anybody there. I mean, you walk into the fencing room at the Malcolm Athletic Center, and you have portraits going back to 1900. There's something to being a part of something with such a long legacy that I think is really powerful. Ready, fence. Finish strong on your touch. That's good. Harvard fencing began on January 8th, 1889 as a club sport, but soon transformed into a varsity sport at Harvard College. The first four fencing coaches at Harvard, Pianelli, Laz Leblois, Dan Guy, and Rene Perroy, were all great French fencers. They were the heart and soul of Harvard fencing from 1902 until Ado Marion came on the scene. In the fall of 1952, after Rene Perroy retired, he left the team without a coach. There was very little interest in fencing at that time, and the director of athletics said, we're probably going to turn it into a club sport. My father knew an Olympian who told Harvard that Ado Marion is available and is a European national champion, and he could be a coach. Oh, I like to eat out, man. <laughs> Boys, sit in gut and guard. <laughs> yeah, he was very classic. This ability with language and his athletic ability and his precision. Ado, using a saber, you could feel what power was. He was too polite to call somebody stupid, so he used the expression anti-talents. In other words, if you did something really dumb, you with anti-talents, anti-talents. He was very close to his fencers. They looked up to him. I remember my freshman year telling him how sad I was that my girlfriend had broken up with me, and he said, Sam, in my country, what we say is just like the streetcar. One goes by, five minutes later, another one comes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that didn't really make me feel any better. The highlight of my father's career was the 1969 NC2A championships. Larry Citrullo, Tom Keller in 69, that's a legendary team. The Citrullo era was very big. Along with Tom Keller, Larry Citrullo was one of my dad's stars. I loved the man. He was like a second father to me. And my father loved Larry. Larry comes from the most distinguished fencing family in the United States. Fencing was a passion for me, and it was a passion for our family. The first time I met Larry, we were in the Junior Olympics. We were both thrown out of the competition for either throwing our mask or talking back to the director. And I remember we were watching the finals on the sidelines, and Larry said, 
What the heck are we doing on the sidelines? We're the two best guys here. He had an, uh, what's the right word here? Not an arrogance, but he had a, a he was very uh, assured of himself that he was very, very good. And he was. 1969, we went to North Carolina State to fence in the NCAA championships. And we came down after three days of competition with Tom Keller and I tied for first place in foil for Tom and myself in Sabre. Tom Keller fenced off against Tony Kessler for the NCAA championship. Tom led throughout the entire bout. Kessler ties four to four. One touch for the United States championship. Tom lost the last touch lost the NCAA championship, came in second. It wasn't a surprise, but that was the greatest moment of my life. Tom lost 5-4. And he was crying, and Ado was crying, and the three of us embraced. But I then had to gather myself and get out on the strip because now it was my turn. In those days, Sabre was not an electric weapon. It was judged by individuals. They called it a jury, 4-4. Four one more touch and I win the NCAA championship. I hit him twice, he didn't hit me at all. The jury decides the touch against me and I lose the NCAA championship. I can close my eyes today and I can tell you every single move of that bout, that five touch bout for the NCAA championship. And I, to this day, know that I hit Braslau twice in that final touch and he didn't hit me at all and yet he won the NCAA championships and I came in second. My father told me about that. He said I was, I was, he said I, we were so close. That won't hurt a little bit. So that was the only time really that I can recall where he was uh, disappointed that he was so close yet he was second. Fencing is strategic. You really have to have a game plan going in. You cannot just wing it. You really have to think about your opponent and how you want to approach him. People who win you know, the Olympics, they are not just athletes, but in many respects artists and truly controlling uh, their environment uh, and the tool that they have in their hand, which is a foil saber or an epee. The epee is the dueling weapon. It's sort of the essential fencing in the sense that you can hit the person anywhere. You're not, it's the least rule-oriented of the three weapons. You have someone who's generally, from physically, they're taller. It's an advantage to be tall. An epee fencer was far more deliberate, far more measured. You know, it seems like there's more mind games going on before the action. Epee, it's a lot of like more composed, quiet people. There's foil, which is not a simulation of a duel, but the simulation of the training for a duel. So the target is reduced to the vital organs only. Foil fencers now can be compact. They are very maneuverable. It might actually be the hardest one because a lot of foils have these unbelievably deep on guards and they have to be able to move back and forth and keep this intensity going and then explode out. It's got some of the quickness of Sabre but also requires the endurance of Epic. No, we know it's the best. It's, it's not a competition. It's just, he is, foil fencing is the best. And then the third weapon is Sabre, which is a simulation of a horseback cavalry charge. Sabre fencing, and that uh, is truly a, a special group. In Sabre you can slash as you would with a cavalry sword. And the target is anything from the waist up. There still are some stereotypes. Sabre is a lot of hotheads. Sabre is like hot-headed. They are out there to do damage. You don't have a lot of time to think. You know, it's kind of like ready, set, boom. Running and slashing movements and very Ooh, I'd, I'd like to get you right now. I'd like to take you 15 touches right now. This is the right weapon for me because you need the least amount of patience for Sabre, and I am definitely not patient. Fencing many times is being called chess at 100 miles an hour. It's the marriage between the athleticism and the intellect. What was, I think, special at Harvard was you're dealing with a particularly bright group of people who thought a lot about the strategy and the tactics and that 
gave those people who had never fenced before a very serious edge. You have to be smart to be a fencer because you have to be able to kind of think on your feet. You have to be able to change your strategy at the drop of a hat. If your opponent is pairing, think about why he's pairing. Think about wh what is his game that he's wanting to do. And now think about when he can step up in his game and when he can touch him. Sizing them up psychologically, creating a psychological profile of your opponent was the fascinating part of it. Is he going to be mad if you do a certain touch? Is he a guy who will freak out if you, if you toe touch him? You have to have tactical implementation in real time, which is a reflex, and that's what you train for. Harvard didn't have the reputation of being the greatest fencing school. Columbia had a huge advantage. A school like Harvard had a huge disadvantage. Harder to get into, tougher requirements, and not in the epicenter of fencing, which is New York City. I only applied to Columbia and NYU. I never applied anywhere else. All the big clubs were in New York. The top coaches were at these clubs. If you weren't from New York City, and you were in a bout against a guy from New York City, and the referee from, was from New York City, you might well count on losing every possible point you could. In the early 70s, <laughs> um, we were middling, we were middling. Nobody could beat Columbia in those days. Columbia and NYU were the pinnacle of the sport. Columbia was the preeminent fencing program in America. They won the NCAA championships, the Eastern championships, the Ivy League championships, and were undefeated. Harvard was never a threat as far as losing the meat. We'd usually beat them probably 20 to 7 or 19 to 8. It was a fun trip. They would always win like 1, 2, 3. It was really depressing. In 72, Coach Marion really had a spectacular coup. Yes, I will never forget this. My sophomore year, we actually tied Columbia for the Ivy League Championship because we beat them in the dual meet for the first time in 22 years. Before that match, there was clearly two things that were going to happen as far as I was concerned. One, Columbia was gonna lose, and two, uh, I was gonna win my bouts. So both things happened. And I'll never forget, the last bout came down to 4-4 four, four tie, <laughs> and they said, is ready, fence, it was electric. He stuck up his hand and wouldn't like him on, and we won. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> I knew how disappointed Coach Bancudi was that I didn't come to Columbia, but I also realized how disappointed he was that I would be the one changing 22 years of Columbia Harvard history. I have never heard of the Zorro of the Ivy League. I've never heard of the Zorro of the Ivies. I'm unaware of the Zorro of the Ivies. Um, I'm going to say he's on our team. Uh, I would say that I am the Zorro of the Ivies. <laughs> In the Citrullo family, Zorro was a joke. Zorro, our currency was Cyrano de Bergerac. By Zorro, you mean... Um... I have heard of that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I was intimidated by him because he was, I think, a much better fencer than I was at that time. He fenced with uh, ferocity. Not only could this guy move faster on his feet than I had ever seen, but the attacks came from someplace that I had no idea. Watching him fence was very inspirational. He was a classic stud at the time. A guy you'd see trailed by two to three beautiful women. He was quite a colorful, colorful guy. Gallant, dashing, handsome, and a superb swordsman. Zorro of the Ivies, Philippe Bennett, no doubt. I remember waking up and picking up the issue of the Crimson. I immediately wanted to hide. Oh my God, everyone's going to read this. At least I was not the Zero of the Ivies. <laughs> there you go. There were no women fencers in the 67 to 71 era. There was fencing at Radcliffe, but it was just foil. The other weapons were not considered ladylike. For a long time, women's saber was considered an impossibly unfeminine invention that couldn't, you know, the physique couldn't withstand it. And girls did sometimes come to practice, and I, I think they technically had a team, but it was, it's not at all like it is now. Today, there's absolutely no separation at all because the NCAA, the way it's structured right now, it's, it's a combined championship. You have a real sense of equality, especially when you have really strong female fencers as you do at Harvard, and you get a sense of like, yeah, like you can compete with the guys, you can practice with the guys. I think it's a wonderful thing to have a combined uh, program.
the men and the women interact and they, they help each other out. We all practiced together and everybody was forced to fence with everybody else and you were brought up because of how good the, guy, the people you were fencing against were. I graduated with the class of 81 and at the time women only fenced foil, so I was a foil fencer. It was just a few years after Radcliffe and Harvard had officially merged. We were on the Radcliffe team, but it was now a merged school, so we were two teams within one roof and one main coach, Ben Zivkovic. Brenemir Zivkovic. Ben was a real tiger on the strip and a great fencer and a great coach. Ben was solid Eastern European, disciplined, talented, rigorous. And Ben was a real entrepreneur. Best known actually for his engineering innovations, which are quite remarkable. You know, fencing is very much an electrical engineering problem to determine who is actually scoring points within fractions of a second in motions that are too fast for most people to see. He was looking to upgrade and modernize fencing equipment. So he developed masks, for example, with plexiglass windows. He experimented with wireless scoring. The team also won the IFAs in FA his first year. So that was a big shot in the arm for the team at that time. It hadn't been done by Harvard fencers since 1935. That result, which came out of the blue against the best FA team in the country, that was something that meant a lot. brought the team together as more of a unit. The team got bigger, uh, co-ed. I love being on a co-ed team. For one thing, um, you got to meet men in a, in, a, in a natural setting. You got to know them well. There has definitely been some team zest during my years on HFT. The team zest is it's fun. <laughs> it is a little known, but well documented in certain circles that fencers have Excellent core strength. <laughs> that served us well. Let's, let's just put it that way. Very, very strong quads, very strong glutes, very strong abs. <laughs> People became friends and more than friends. Two of my former teammates are dating as we speak and also another set got married. Well, through fencing, uh, I met the love of my life. When I started fencing, I didn't think it was sexy, but now I would say that it was. Let me tell you why fencing is sexy. Form-fitting uniforms, how about that, okay? And uh, I say that without hesitation, and I even understand that that's a risk because I'm now not so form-fitting as I used to be. When I came to Harvard in 1999, uh, Harvard was in dead last. Men's fencing team, was last in the Ivy League. In terms of turning things around, I gave myself five years to, to win an Ivy League championship. By the time I graduated, we had gotten some really great new recruits, and we had the best season in, I think, 25 years. It seemed that the team eventually got to be very deep and strong, where they were attracting top domestic fencers and top international fencers when Peter Brand took over. He's a fantastic coach, but he's also a very caring and funny individual. You felt comfortable talking to Peter about anything because he felt comfortable talking to you about anything. Uncle Peter, we call him. There's a nickname for him, uh, Uncle Peter. Uncle Peter is what we call him. He called himself Uncle Peter. I, I, I just called him Peter. I went to a doctor's office one time and he said, and I said, doctor, it hurts me when I go like that. He said, don't go like that. How's that? <laughs> some people get it and some people might not, but that's the beauty of those jokes. Part of the tools that I utilize is humor. I look at sport as something that is supposed to be fun. We're not nation building here, we're uh, engaged in, in play. There's more cohesiveness under Peter Brand. He really turned, I would say, uh, Harvard fencing from a very good program to a spectacular program. It's hard to, to listen to him and not have faith, you know, the Harvard fencing team is the best. We've had a great string of success in the last 10 years under Peter Brand. It seemed like the team developed a new team spirit. This is special, like this is a really close group. Emily Cross from Harvard University is among the fencing medalists here in Beijing. We find that individuals that come in who are 
sometimes very average fences perform at a much higher level when they are supported by their teams and their coaches. I like having people count on me. There are a lot of people who depend on you, but at the same time you have this huge support net. You spend so much time in the gym with these fencers that inevitably they become your closest friends. So you're not just fencing for yourself, but you're fencing for them. Your results actually count towards something bigger, and I think that has motivated me to work harder. I think that has made the results that I have gotten so much more special because I've done it with my team. I've refereed a lot of Harvard meets over the years, but the most intense one where I really saw the team spirit come out was at the Ivy League Championships. Last year, we had Jerry Chang in the final against UPenn, which would basically determine the outright winner of the whole competition. And we were down big. We lost the first three saver bath, and we were coming back the whole time. Found ourselves at 13-13 with one bout left, which was me versus my brother. And so I had my whole team behind me, my brother in front of me, and his whole team on his side. And it was a five-touch match. Winner takes the championship. It's like no other event I've ever seen, and, and I've refereed at the Olympic Games twice, I've refereed at the NCAAs for 25 years. There's something so different about the Ivy League. The 2013 Ivy League fencing round robins at Gordon Track on the campus of Harvard University, it was a family act. The last bout was 4-4 between two brothers. Chang, one from Harvard and one from Penn. I've been in that 13-13 spot. That's, <laughs> that's a tough spot to be in, and if you're fencing your brother, I can't even imagine. Ivy League Championships is you know, probably the biggest objective. Practically shaking. We, we, we didn't know um, what was going to happen. Last touch, I surprised my brother, made an attack. He took a parry, and I released into it, and won it 5-4. Our whole team goes crazy, like everyone's jumping up and down, they storm the strip. When he got that final touch, it was just a rampage. I was so excited, I ran to the box, I didn't even see a wire, I fell on my face. A lot of us were in tears. It was really uh, an intense battle, obviously. The Ivy League uh, fencing is the strongest league in the nation. It always comes down to this, almost every year and I'm just proud of my guys. Fencing is exactitude. People talk about there's right and there's wrong. I like to say there's right and there's not quite right, and that comes from fencing. Fencing is determination. I have learned through the sport to go for it, not to give up, and to live up to the expectations that I have given to people. Fencing is passion. Fencing is everything. Fencing is life. Fencing is life. Fencing is the best. Fencing's okay. The team is awesome. in the course of making this documentary, you could find a human female 
who was impressed that someone was a fencer uh, or to whom it gave any sort of cachet at all. I don't think there are such creatures. I never saw one.